Earlier today, a physician who was just indicted in a massive fraud case texted me, Justin, we really need to speak. I said, I agree. When we spoke, I was a little taken aback at the content of his question. Namely, he wanted to know more about the jobs and food in prison. I said, Doc, I've been there. I empathize with you. When I got into trouble, I too was fixated on the food, the job, the commissary, the prison hustle. But let's get back to what's most important, mitigation. And also right now, preparing for the hardest part, coming home from prison because you're in your 40s. The government alleges you owe millions of dollars in prison. You've just stated it's most likely you plead guilty. You've never done anything without your license to be a doctor, like you should also be fixated on what happens when you come home. He's like, I totally agree. I have no plan. What do I do? I said, aha, let's get to work. He said, what do I do next? I said, well, in about two hours, which is right now, I'm going to film a video from chapter one of my new book. I'm actually just going to read the chapter. I'll chime in. I'll probably see some typos that bother me, some things I'll eventually change. The book won't be out till the end of the year, but I was super excited to complete this 20 chapter, 40 to 50,000 Word book, have it out by the end of the year. No real deadline, but I'm really enjoying the process of writing again, filming. And I really hope it helps you if you're traversing a government investigation. So grateful that you're here at the White Collar Advice channel. Please like, subscribe, and comment. Let's dive in, shall we, with chapter one that I call Rebuilding 2.0, How to Reinvent Yourself After a Government Investigation. Chapter one, the journey begins. Stoicism really impacted me in prison. So every chapter of the book both at the beginning and throughout the book has some uh, quotes, mainly from you know the Stoics, Epictetus. You'll see some Socrates and Aristotle as well. But the quote for this chapter one is uh, Seneca, difficulty strengthen the mind as labor does the body. My name is Justin Paperni. On April 28th, 2005, exactly three years to the day before I would surrender to federal prison for 18 months, my life instantly changed. On that day, the FBI showed up at my home in Studio City to tell me that I was the target of a federal investigation. Suddenly, I found myself in a situation I had never imagined. It was a shocking transition. In just a moment, I went from being a successful executive, comfortable, comfortable in my own skin, to feeling lost, confused, and weak. I was utterly unprepared for what was to come. The path that led to my government investigation began after I graduated from the University of Southern California in 1997. To understand the full context, I refer you to my books, Lessons from Prison and Ethics in Motion. If you do not have the time or interest in reading the books, I'll sum it up for you quickly. My priorities shifted after, after I graduated USC. While building my career in the brokerage business, I lost sight of the values that guided me as a student athlete. The emphasis on prestige and money overshadowed the importance of considering the impact of my actions on others. For years, I failed to cultivate an ethical core or center that I could rely on, unlike a pro athlete who can draw upon their training and track record under pressure. When I finally met with the FBI, I had no such foundation to fall back on, and I paid the price. My lack of an ethical center left me ill-prepared to handle the investigation. When I met with the FBI, I lied repeatedly. I was terrified and unprepared, and my lies only made matters worse. My unwillingness to invest the time necessary to understand how I found myself in this predicament led to compounded issues. If you were in a crisis, your first goal should be not to worsen things. It's too easy to panic, act without thinking, and cause further damage. The cliche goes, when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Your focus should be on laying the groundwork for a successful reinvention. The more you can limit the damage, the better position you'll be to move forward. I only understood that lesson once That lesson once I was in federal prison. My journey into the federal prison system or criminal justice system was a humbling experience. The hardest part was the waiting and the wondering. The period between learning of the investigation and sentencing was marked, was marked by fear, uncertainty, and a constant sense of limbo. Prison was easier to bear because it was clearly defined with a start and end date. To be clear, I had it easier than most. I was 33 years old when I surrendered to Taft Federal Prison Camp, now closed. As a single dude without children, I didn't bear the heavy emotional toll of being separated from a wife or children. My sentence was short, further easing the difficulty of my time in federal prison. Also, serving time in a minimum security camp is nothing like the prison experiences we see sensationalized on television or in the movies. Indeed, Epictetus had it right when he wrote, Man is not worried by real problems so much as by his imagined anxieties about real problems. The mental anguish about life in prison was much more daunting than the actual or real experience. Before prison, I coped poorly with my emotions, often shutting out my family and avoiding conversations about my impending imprisonment. In prison, I became stoic, a trait that became both a strength and a weakness. But I know that's not the case for everyone. 
Many of you might face the daunting prospect of a lengthy sentence or the pain of being thousands of miles away from your loved ones. I understand that my journey might have been easier in many ways, and I'm not here to dismiss the very real hardships that you might be experiencing. Indeed, our team empathizes. The goal here is not to compare hardships, but to emphasize that reinvention can and must begin regardless of the situation. As an aside, I know many of you feel you're trapped in a government investigation through no fault of your own. And while it might not be your fault, it is your problem to respond. In my first months in prison, I was living in denial. I was clinging to the hope that I could return to selling real estate at Sotheby's International's Realty in Calabasas with my close friend and business partner, Sam Pompeo. I thought my securities industry conviction wouldn't affect my real estate license. I was wrong. It was one in a million chances I would keep my license and my refusal to accept responsibility resulted in wasted months, months I spent aimlessly exercising and doing nothing else of substance in prison. During this period, I met Michael Santos, a fellow prisoner serving a 45 year sentence. Michael had transformed his or turned his imprisonment into an opportunity for personal growth and transformation. His example was a wake up call for me. Michael became my mentor and later my business partner. His guidance helped me realize the need for discipline, accountability and action crucial principles for anyone navigating a crisis. The conversations with Michael, his unfiltered feedback, and his daily challenges forced me to stop playing the victim and start working on personal responsibility. My first few visits in federal prison were painful. I had no answers to the questions my parents had about my future. How would I pay back my $535,000 in restitution? How would I support myself when I got home? Would I be able to keep my real estate license? When are the wife and grandkids coming? It was a brutal reminder of my reality. Even my well-meaning friends contributed to my anxiety, unknowingly putting more pressure on me. In October 2008, after finally accepting Michael's tutelage, I began to see the, the path toward genuine change. My reinvention began with writing my first blog with Michael on October 12, 2008. This blog symbolizes to symbolizes my commitment to my family to improve, to document my experience through prison, share lessons learned, and provide value to others traversing this wretched system. Rather than merely talk about change, I chose to finally do the work. The rebuilding process began with that first blog in prison, and it continues today. I always strive to improve, even though I often need to catch up to my expectations or capabilities. With Michael's leadership, I started seeing my experience in prison not as a burden, but an opportunity to reassess my values, rebuild my life, and assist others going through similar circumstances. Now, I'll read my first blog from prison the 12th of October, 2008. It's Sunday, October 12th, 2008. I'm in my assigned cubicle at Taft Federal Prison Camp. I'm seated in a plastic chair with my feet propped up on the steel frame of my bunk. My two by four locker is open, and on the inside of the door, I see a calendar that I've drawn in pencil. I noticed that more than five months have passed since my imprisonment began back on April 28, 2008. It's hard to believe I've made it this far. I still remember the day I self-surrendered to prison. My older brother and mother dropped me off with a clear understanding that it would be more than a year before I would walk back out that prison door. I'm still haunted by the tears that came from my mother as I was led away by correctional officers in handcuffs. No mother should have to endure such heartbreak. I'm serving an 18-month sentence for crimes related to my earlier career as a stockbroker at UBS. I had graduated from USC in 1997, and I built a successful practice as a professional investment advisor during my 20s. My particular focus was managing money for professional baseball players and executing bulk trades for hedge funds. Prison was not part of the life trajectory that I had envisioned. The investigation that led to my confinement started on December 5, 2004. From that day forward, I felt racked with anxiety. Living in denial, I made some awful decisions. My delusions into believing that I would not be targeted for prosecution led me into a web of lies. Those lies resulted in me spending tens of thousands of dollars in unnecessary legal expenditures and exposed me to the potential of much stiffer legal sanctions. Besides the cost, which approached a quarter of a million dollars, my total ignorance of the legal process resulted in unnecessary stress for my family and friends. None of us knew anyone who had gone through the criminal justice system before. My life quickly turned into a self-fulfilling prophecy, convincing myself and everyone, or everyone around me that it would be fine. I did not even have the foresight to cancel my application to join the prestigious Lakeside Country Club. My ultimate conviction caused great embarrassment to the members who sponsored me. I failed to study so I can learn the differences between minimum security federal prison camps 
in those lockdown prison shows that have become so popular on those alternative television networks. I still remember my mother telling me, son, you were not made for federal prison, so you better prepare and cooperate fully. Her advice went in one ear and out the other. It took greater than two and a half years for me to even accept that prison was a possibility. Once I did, I advanced through the process as if I was a man in his final days. As far as I could see, my life was over. I ate like a glutton, gaining 20 pounds. Humiliated by my lost fortunes, I neglected everyone by hiding. I wanted it all to end. Yet from the time I opened my eyes in the morning till the time I lay down to sleep, all I could feel was the vortex into which I was sinking. In retrospect, I know that what I needed was a guide through federal prison camp. My struggles felt magnified because I had no idea about what would happen from day one to the next. It turns out that it turns out my concerns about federal prison camp were way overblown. It was no club fed, but without fences and bars, Taft Federal Prison Camp is hardly reminiscent of a true prison. When I asked my attorney what I could expect, he could not provide the specifics I craved. You'll be fine, was the best he could muster. The day I self-surrendered was the worst. I just had no idea what to expect. The handcuffing, the strip search, the fingerprinting, the DNA sample, and my, my mugshot initially seemed too much to take. I was locked in a small cell while I waited to be processed to the camp. When I finally made it to the camp, I felt exhausted and lost. I remember feeling overwhelmed as if the months would never pass. I did not know anything about good time possibilities or halfway house options or what awaited me on supervised release. I tried to sleep, but struggled with the tormented thoughts that came with my separation from home. I miss my mom, my father, my brother, and my dog. The concrete and steel of prison, the indignity of common restrooms, the lack of total privacy seemed too much to take. Day by day, however, I grew stronger. I began to set little goals and empowered myself with success. Exercise helped. I had been a baseball player at USC, yet the pursuit of my career brought a simultaneous neglect of my fitness. My second day in federal prison camp, I began to run. I huffed and puffed around that track, determined to power through three miles. I rode the stationary bike and strength training, push-ups, pull-ups, and dips. Slowly, I could see that I was willing my way back into better spirits. After a few months, I reached a small victory when my counselor agreed to transfer me from a three-man cubicle into a two-man cubicle. A couple of months after that, I was promoted to a job that offered more time, more free time for me to work on my personal goals. The time opened more opportunities for introspection. That was the time I realized that others were confronting the same challenges as me. Convinced that I could help them, I decided to begin writing this daily journal. Through these daily recordings of my activities, I strive to spare others the anxieties that accompany the unknown. I want those who are confronting criminal charges to grasp the realities rather than the debilitating myths about what is to come. These daily postings from federal prison camp will illustrate the ups and downs of the prison experience. And with more than five months of confinements in the books, I speak with authority when I write that the journey does not have to be a waste. By following my daily postings, these final months of my sentence, I intend to provide readers with a glimpse into the unknown world of confinement. That glimpse will empower those and empower those who anticipate a struggle with the criminal justice system. It will help them make better decisions and enable them to move forward confidently. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, and where there is darkness, my writings will provide sight. Justin Paperni, Taft Prison Camp, registration number 4449912. And every day after that, I had a blog until I was released the 20th of May, 2009. My experience taught me that the reinvention process is a process that takes time. Slow and steady wins the race. It takes constant effort, a willingness to confront and accept your, your reality, and a determination to make the most of your circumstances. This is not a journey that you can embark on passively. It is not a path for the lazy or faint-hearted. It demands active participation and daily consistent action. You must want it. The lessons I learned in prison under the guidance of Michael and through my introspection became the foundation of my second career as an author, speaker, and advocate for justice-impacted individuals. The books I later wrote, the speeches I delivered, and the platform I co-founded, White Collar Advice, all stemmed from this life-altering experience. In the chapters ahead, we will dig into the real stuff, the nitty-gritty of what reinvention really looks like. We'll explore acknowledging mistakes without excuses, embracing honesty, and reinventing yourself daily. I'll share how to make amends, demonstrate change, manage your online reputation, be patient yet persistent, and commit to integrity. We'll also discuss overcoming stigma, valuing work, thinking about your legacy, avoiding pitfalls, drawing strength from hardship, finding guidance and philosophy, educating yourself, building new connections, and pursuing a new career. We'll even cover dating after prison and what ongoing maintenance looks like in the long term. 
This isn't just about reading, it's about acting. Reflect Reflect on my journey, ponder your situation, and don't hesitate to take that first step. Your journey starts now. Lastly, while we may never meet or work together, know that I, ser- though I sincerely hope we do, I want you to know that I empathize with you. I understand you in a way we are family. We find ourselves on a journey we never imagined we would embark on, and it's my privilege to assist you in reinventing yourself. At the end of every chapter, there are going to be questions that I hope people who read or listen to the book will consider answering. Here are some of the end of chapter reflections. What are the circumstances in your life that have brought you to this point? How do they compare to my experiences? Number two, how are you handling your current situation? Are you taking actions that might make things worse or are you working towards limiting damage and rebuilding? Three, do you have a support system or a mentor? How are they assisting you in your journey? Number four, reflect on your daily routine. How are you spending your time? Is it aiding your growth or contributing to your stagnation? Number five, What steps can you take today to begin the process of reinvention? What long-term strategies can you put in place? Remember, the value of this book lies not just in reading it, but in applying its lessons. I urge you to answer these questions honestly and reflect on your responses. I'd like to add in here they should be shared with your family. I'll make that note. Only through honest introspection can you hope to navigate the path ahead. Michael taught me growth and transformation are possible, no matter how bleak the situation may look. So there we have it, 16 minutes into chapter one of of my new book. If it's a book you'd like to read or have interest in, just leave a comment or send an email to support at whitecollaradvice.com. And like any of the books that we produce, we'll send it to you once it's complete at absolutely no cost. Thank you very much for continuing to join us on this journey. Hope you found value in chapter one. We're just getting started and I'll plan to read more chapters. And while it's complete, I'm going to read more chapters when, uh, when I think it's ready and it's time. Thank you for again. Thank you again for joining our community. Bye-bye.